Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. My name is Daniel Yan. It's leading an agrarian team in 5RD. In this team, we are always thinking about how to help deliver to realize their idea into a real project. This is the reason why we create SR Works and the SR Enable SDK in order to speed up the SR development. Today, I'm having a topic, how to use SR Works and the SR Enable to benefit the future of the SR development. Before we getting started, we had better to know why is XR first. As it shows on the screen, XR is a big amber, umbrella, cover entire continuum from reality to virtual reality. So for the future of the XR development, an application should be able to jump between various paradigms easily, and our SDK can help you on this. For the future of the SR development, the product is longer the base of the value. The experience is. Thus, we should consider what kind of experience we should bring out to our end user. So I list a few of major factors that may impact our SR experience. First, temporal realism. This is such a latency. Second, feature realism such as a crucian shown on the top right figure. It is very important for us to distinguish the relative distance between objects. Third, spatial realism. For example, shown on the bottom right figure, we need able to place a virtual object at the right physical position as we expect. Fourth, Semantic realism, it means the interaction behavior should make sense to human's knowledge. For example, we always expecting the human working on the surface of the floor rather than working in the air. We always take this factor in our mind when we are designing our SDK. So let's take a look what we have achieved today. You can see there are real physical correlation between real and the virtual objects. We also can create a portal to connect real and the virtual world together and have a good interaction between them. The player can even go into the virtual world and back into with the real world. If we close the portal, it is a complete immersive VR environment. You can easily create another portal and go back to the rear again. Probably you want to play golf at home like this. or make a mess on the floor. That will be very easy to clean it up. <laughs> so the following agenda, I will introduce what kind of experience SR Works and SR Enable could provide to you to be used in your project. And I will address our future roadmap at the end. So let's start from the Star Wars, SR Works. Why is SR works? In terms of architecture, it is a framework able to quickly and easily enable your application with SR capability. It must be very simple to use and flexible to extend. Currently, it supports Unity and Unreal plugin on Windows platform. This is its generic architecture. It's very simple, only three layers. Input process and output. Input usually is a highway dependent driver to get census data. About output, typically is a rendering driver to show the result to the display. Process is a function proper 
you can connect each other to compose a pipeline. Or you can get a desired result in the middle of the pipeline, just like the output two and three. Or you can pass it to the render to show on the display. If you want to add a new feature, you can drop the function in the pool and assign its input and output respectively. It's very simple and flexible. What is SRWorks? In terms of functionality, SRWorks has a percent, per, perception ab ability to see and reconstruct 3D geometry of the environment. Furthermore, it has the intelligence to understand your surroundings. In order to achieve the perception ability, SRWorks implement three major functions at this point. Stereo region see through, depth acquisition, and uh, 3D reconstruction. Fiber is the first highway SRWorks supported. Next, let's go over each function one by one. The main purpose of the CSU function is to provide human-like stereo vision perception. On FIPO, it uses the dual camera to simulate the stereo vision. This approach is called video based, shown on the right hand side. It acquires digital image of the real world from dual camera to mix with the computer graphic generated image together and send it to the display. Um, in front of each eye. This approach is easy to achieve through occlusion because it, you are able to manipulate each single piece of the real world image. This is different from the optical based approach shown on the right hand side, which is direct view of the real world. This is its pipeline for CSU. As our works implement a dual camera driver for you to acquire the video stream from dual camera, then send it to the C2 for further processing. Then you can get the rectified stereo image to show on the display to perform the stereo feature. Next, let's see what has done inside the C2. Because we want, we want the wider FOV, so we use the fish eye camera. You can see on the left hand side image, it has some distortion. So we have to convert it from the fish eye image to the pinhole model. The result is shown on the right hand side. In order to allow application easily to place a virtual object on it's padded the visual position as a result on the right hand side picture. So SRWorks have done co coordinate alignment for you to have the scale in the virtual environment is equivalent to real physical dimension. And as mentioned previously, it is a video base. So you can do any post-processing to create a fantastic feature effect before rendering to the display. We have done several filters in the SDK for you, just like the picture shown on the screen. Of course, you can done this filter by yourself. The purpose of depth acquisition is to provide real distance between <laughs> HND and the environment. This is its pipeline. It is behind C through to get the rectified steel image to do depth estimation. You could get this map directly or pass it to rendering to show the result on the panel. Here is a rendering example using a color gradient to represent distance range from near to far. Red color means the near, 
and the double is far away distance. Here is an example you can use the Davis map to produce the occlusion effect. Because we already know the depth information of the real environment, so we could apply it into the G buffer of the 3D engine. And 3D engine know how to mix the real and the virtual object according to their relative distance relation to have a collision effect. Like this example shown on the screen, you can easily understand the position of the virtual white ball is in between your real hands. This is a lightweight approach for occlusion effect without creating mesh collider. However, without mesh collider, 3D engine cannot simulate the physical collision for you. For example, use your hand to hit a virtual ball. That's the reason why we create the dynamic mesh function for you. Dynamic function means generally 3D mesh collider from depth information frame by frame. There's no connection between two frames. So if you move your view from one to another, the previous general image collider is gone. You can configurable to select your interest distance range. For example, if you only need to check your hand, you could set the direction range around your arm length only. So let's see a demo. We create a dimension mesh on the hand, so you can have a physical interaction between the real hand and the virtual fish. <coughs> About a 3D reconstruction allow five pro to do special mapping. However, it's different from dimension mesh we just mentioned about it. Because 3D reconstruction continuously fuses the general mesh frame by frame together, so it can reconstruct the entire 3D environment for you to, in to interact with the real world. This is an example. You can see it fuses the mesh frame by frame, so it can reconstruct the enti entire 3D environment. This is a pipeline. 3D reconstruction is behind the depth to receive the depth map for further process. You can get the scan result in the middle or pass it to render to show in on the screen. As our works generate dynamic adaptive mesh, it means it will automatically adjust the mesh size according to the geometry complexity of the scan in area. The more pressed area will have smaller mesh size in order to fit the detail of the shape. You can configure the minimal size of the mesh to trade off between the computation loading and the details of the object shape. After scan finish, you can save the scan result as an OBJ file with the collider for later use. This collider property includes orientation, shape, and area size. We provide API to let you figure out what kind of service you desire for later use. SRWs also allow you to submit this process user interaction during perform spatial mapping. No need to pre-scan the environment first. Here's a demo. So you can see there is a physical correction why you are performing the spatial mapping. And the shadow effect and the occlusion.
Till now, even as our world with perception, it can only tell you the 3D geometry of the environment, but still cannot tell you what kind of object around you. So it is still hard for an application to do meaningful interaction with the real environment, such, a, such as a guy or uh, avatar to take a seat. That's the reason why we implement an AI vision module to learn as it works, can understand what you are seeing now. Let's see a, feed, a demo. After spatial mapping, the recognize the object will be segmented out. You can use this object for your further story development. So how we add the AI feature into the SR work pipeline? We just place in the function pool and uh, assign its input from the C through and uh, direct its output to the 3D reconstruction. Then a new pipeline is created. So next then see what text task has done inside the AI vision module. The first is the 3D segmented segmentation. It will classify each single piece of image to belong in one class of the object. An example shown on the bottom right, the recognized objects are segmented in different color. Currently, you can recognize nine classes of the objects. We we'll provide a chaperone example using 2D segmentation in our SDK for your reference. It can help you to monitor if there are people go inside the play zone area for your safety. Furthermore, we have provided a 3D segmentation. You can enable it to run at the background while you are performing spatial mapping. After finish again, the recognized object will be segmented out. Currently, six classes of type, six classes of object can be recognized. You can see an example on the bottom right. After you point a rear chair in the image, it will show you the segmented 3D image for you with the class type. Currently, you can support six class type. Here's a summary for SRW currently supported. And you can start downloading SRW SDK from this SDK link. Or you can see again today's video in this video link or join our forum to pose your question for our improvement. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so Daniel will we'll be back. This is end of part one. What we're gonna do now is have a guest speaker. Uh, Gasper from uh, Project Go Studios is gonna show us how we used this uh, SDK, the SR Works. All right, so first, thanks to everybody for being here. I mean, it's a pleasure to show you a little sample of what I've been working on. So last year, HTC invited us to play a little bit with the SR SDK, and we developed this demo of about a portal that you actually step through from one experience into another, so kind of like mixing realities. And that's what I'm gonna be talking about today. So, in the interest of time, I'll try to speed through this as much as possible. So we're a small studio based out of Atlanta. We primarily do games, but we also do other types of content. There's our email. We totally love to help. So if you guys have any additional questions after the meeting, just either stop, stop me in the hallway or feel free to write us. We like to respond and we like to help. So why did we go with SR Works? So the first thing that happened was Early last year at CES, 
Um, we already had seen HoloLens. HoloLens was really expensive. Uh, the input device was purely hand tracking. There was not really a good control for it. And the other hardware for augmented reality that was mentioned was the Magic Leap, which up to that point to me was a total myth. I have never seen one. Most people had not even seen one in person or knew what it could do. And then I was presented with the Vive Pro and the Vive Pro was there, accessible, affordable, not to mention that it used the same tools and the same creation pipeline that I've always used for all my VR content. I didn't have to go with an external source or an external, you know, an external set of programs to make my, my executables. Everything was there and there was no learning curve to it. Um, so then the next thing was, so what are we going to create? So for me, once we talked about the Vive Pro and the SR SDK, we figured, wow, this is like augmented reality, but it could be so much more. We could actually have the opportunity here to do something really unique, which is what in my humble opinion, and I'm not trying to define what mixed reality is, but for me, mixed reality has always been what if we could actually mix reality with augmented and virtual reality all in one seamless experience? So we saw, the, we saw this opportunity, we were really excited and that's what we decided to go and dive into. So the next question was, are we gonna create something new? We were already deep in development for the game uh, Project Ghost, which we're trying to bring, uh, which we're bringing for, uh, for HTC Vive. And we were thinking about, okay, so do we stop development for a second and we start developing for SR and then come back and revisit our project? Or is there a way in which we can actually integrate the SR features into our project? And through exploration, we realized that it was a better decision to integrate it into what we were doing. And we found out some really interesting lessons. And this is probably the core of what we wanna share with you today. The lessons that we learned through our development process. So the first lesson that we learned was SR can help you make your content really personal to the user. So as before, our game was about cyber ninjas in the future that go ahead and start attacking enemies and, and help save humanity. Now we can actually make the story about you who happens to be transported into the future through a portal and go and battle, you know, battle enemies and save the future. So this created some interesting opportunities for storytelling. Now the story was more meaningful because it was not about an abstract hero or some foreign person. It was entirely about you. Second lesson that we learned was we built the portal. It was all fine and dandy. You step through the portal in, you know, from augmented reality into virtual reality, but it felt like a pure gimmick. Okay, so it's a nice visual special effect but what, what is the real meaning of having that portal? So we decided to see how we could actually bring more intent and meaning into the process. So we decided, let's go ahead and let's make a mini game. And we decided to build something very simple. A pair of hammers, little ghosts start crawling up toward you and you start whacking them, like doing like a whack-a-mole type of game. And then in the middle of the game, without you expecting it, we open the portal and we change the whole reality on you and, you and we tell you, hey, what you're doing is not the real world. There's a battle outside in the future. You need to come and join in. And through that mechanism, we brought a real purpose and intent into using SR, you in the portal, doing the transition from, re from augmented reality into virtual reality, and it became a much more powerful story for our users. The third lesson that we, also, that we learned was that SR and augmented reality was really cool, but it was even so much better when you did it with friends. So during Augmented World Expo, we brought a version of our game where we were doing a 10 by 10 large scale space with multiplayer. And to our surprise, people were having a lot of fun, not only because they were doing the whole augmented reality and the novelty of it, but the fact that you could see the other people, your friends you were playing with, not an abstract representation of them, but the real person. I mean, they were having fun, they were playing, you know, playing and laughing. It was pure chaos. And it definitely brought us a really important factor into the whole why, you know, try to make things social and that also applies for SR. 
Um, the last one, and it was probably the most important lesson that we learned through the whole development process is that we need to learn to work within the hardware limitations and strengths. And some of those limitations can actually become strengths. There's no piece of AR hardware that's perfect. I mean, you can try some of the other stuff out there and they have limited field of view or not exceptional hand tracking and, or input devices. And that also holds true even for, for Vive Pro with SR. I mean, it's a great device, but you have to work with some of the limitations for it. For example, the camera resolution could be better. It's not bad, but could be better. So you can use visual filters to basically mask that a little bit. Number two, there's occlusion, even though, I mean, the earlier version that we're working with didn't have the newer SDKs where occlusion is better implemented. So how do we compensate it for making objects be in front of you or behind you? So we started using a little bit of see-through shaders, especially with the objects that were on the ground, so that if they were actually colliding with your feet, it almost felt like you were going through them like a gelatin slime. And that worked really well. And the number three thing that we discovered is even though we have all these extra tools that we could use, like we could scan the room so we could have all these physical interactions and things bouncing from one wall to the other, since we're actually transporting the player into virtual reality after the fact, at that point, we're not gonna have any objects being obstacles in the play area. So we basically said, let's not do any room scanning and let's just put a flat surface collider uh, so that the objects on the, uh, so all the bounces of, of the objects are in there. So we didn't have to go and do a pre-scan prior to deploying the installation. After all this, some additional lessons that we learned, number one was that SR can make VR more approachable. So one funny anecdote was we had a father and daughter couple that came into play um, our experience and the daughter was a little bit scared about VR. She was scared about, oh, there's spiders in that game. I've never been VR. She was really apprehensive. And we were able to tell her, hey, you know, you're gonna jump into this experience. You're gonna be playing this whack a monster game that's very simple. And you're gonna be able to see your own father with you. So you're never gonna be alone. And if any, and if things get really, you know, really intense, I can always just stop and I'll pull you out from it. So don't worry about it. So she went through the experience and through the, through, during the SR part, doing the make that reality, she was going to town. She was killing monsters left and right, running all over the place. She almost pulled a cord out of the vibe and I had to stop her because she was having so much fun. And then the portal opens up and that's where I started to get, okay, let me see how she reacts to this. She totally went through the portal and started playing the whole game without any hesitation whatsoever. So being able to do that transition from reality into virtual reality definitely help her process to getting acclimated into virtual reality. Number two, SR also helped uh, reducing the operational staff of doing, for example, location-based um, environment entertainment. So usually you would have to have people, you have to put the headset, at that point they don't see what's going on, going on around them and you have to prep them like these are your controls, stand here, like get the other players ready or you would have to have more staff. So in this case, because they were seeing see the, the reality around them, as I was gearing them up, I was able to gear everybody by myself, then have them all together, give them the instructions just one time, and they were ready to go. So that basically can help you reduce cost and even expedite a uh, setup process. And finally, the last thing that I kind of found out was sometimes the simplest and more bear down experiences can be the more the, the, the most fun ones. So our game, our real game in virtual reality, we have cyber ninjas, we have bows and arrows, guns, multiplayer, Icaric avatars and whatnot, and people think it's really, really cool. But when they were playing the simple game of whack a monster, they were totally having pure fun, laughing. I mean, it was pure chaos. It was something that we built in only two days just for the fun of it. And it kind of gave us an idea that sometimes you don't have to go overboard with experiences. If it's fun and enjoyable and multiplayer, and especially for augmented reality, it can go a very long way. And with that, I mean, this is just some of the stuff that we're working uh, after that we're trying to build also as our fishing game and some other experiences. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Gaspar. And I'm going to invite Daniel back to do the second part. Uh, we're going to do Q&A at the very end. 
we have another guest after the second part. Yes, sir, Anipal, which is uh, eye tracking and lip tracking. So let's start talking about, let's start Anipal. Conceptually, we can say SR works is, look, is used to look our world to understand the surroundings around you. It's not enable, it's used to look inward, to read your mind. Currently, it has uh, eye tracking and lip tracking. Let's take a look at uh, this demo first. Is eye tracking? You can precisely know what you are looking at and give you an instant response. Just like the lighting, the light bulb. And you can see uh, avatar is animated to follow your eye movement in the mirror. This is lip tracking. The real lip image is shown in a small circle. And avatar is animated to follow your lip movement. So what is SR Enable? Basically, it's a software framework able to interpret user expression. Currently, it's a pro, lip, and eye tracking. And it's a pro, Unity, and Unreal plugin on Windows platform right now. About the hardware support, for eye tracking, you need a 5 Pro Eye. For lip tracking, you need a 5 lip accessory which is attached to the 5 Pro or 5 Pro I, as shown on the right-hand side picture. This animal input is from the, image, uh, from the eye and the deep camera image. Its coverage is inside the blue color region. Regarding output, for eye tracking, you will in output the gaze factor, pupil size, and eye openings. For a lip, you will generate 26 weight for the corresponding brain shape. Basically, this is a client server architecture. As a runtime is a standalone executable work as the server. Many functions include eye expression, lip expression, and the auto save update. Client side is a part of Unity and the Unreal plugin. It also provides the interface in runtime for third party eye tracking integration. It's an example where support for 4P rendering, and you will direct command with the great feed driver directly to perform the 4P rendering function. So in the content, it doesn't need to handle guest information. For lip tracking, it's very simple. You just need to map the individual lip weight predict from the lip engine with the corresponding friendship done by artists correctly, then all is done. We have provided four avatar sample in our SDK with the brain shape down, so you can start from here to join us. To summary this topic, SR works and the SR enable. For the future, we are keeping improve all aspects of experience. Temperature, temporal realism, we are always thinking all possibility to reduce the latency. Virtual realism, we will provide realistic lighting, such as uh, like this video. The virtual object will reflect the real lighting. We will provide this in the near future. 
For the spatial realism, we're always seeking a better partition algorithm. And for the semantic realism, we will provide more AI capability, like the emotion detection in the future. By the way, if you want to download the SRN for SDK, you can start download from this link, SDK link. And uh, we have separated foreign, one for eye tracking and another one for lip tracking. Thanks. That's it for today. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. And next, we're going to have a guest speaker, Jeff from Ovation. He's going to talk about eye tracking. Hi, everyone. I'm Jeff Marshall, I'm founder of VR Speaking and Ovation, which I'll show you here, is our first title that we launched in October of 2018. Uh, it's a VR public speaking trainer slash simulator. And I like to say, just like a, a pilot would use a flight simulator to prepare and sharpen the skills, so too should a speaker use Ovation for the very same reasons. Um, it's built for PC VR. Uh, most of our customers are in the enterprise market, uh, but individuals are using it as well. Uh, I'm going to talk today about how we've integrated the SR Anapool NAPAL SDK into Ovation, uh, primarily how we're using the Vive Pro I and the eye tracking in it. Um, and then I want to touch a little bit on foveated rendering and how important that is to us. It's uh, my information there if you want to get in touch with me. Uh, so before I, I really talk about the eye tracking, I want to give you just a quick flow of how Ovation works uh, once a, a user would get inside it. So first they would choose a venue. Uh, in this case, is the classroom. There is a boardroom, a hotel conference room, uh, a courtroom, and, and more. And once in there, they would arrange it. They would choose their speech tools. Uh, do they want a handheld microphone? Do they want a slide changer, note card? You know, if you've used it in a, in a speech before, odds are we have it in Ovation. Uh, and as you can see on some of these, for example, with a note card, you import your Word document and it maps to the note card. With the projector slide, you import your PowerPoint and there it is in the virtual world for you to use. Then you sort of arrange the, the audience. You can choose how many people you want in the audience, um, whether they're allowed to be rude, they pull out their cell phone or fall asleep on you, which I hope none of you do. Uh, and then you can set maybe a, a max length for your speech and then you start delivering it. Now, while you're delivering your speech, we are sort of actively training you to improve. So if you say a filler word, um, you know, like, it'll fly out of your mouth as you say it to discourage you from saying it, right? If you're holding a microphone, you know, you've seen people who will sort of just drop it down at their side or they'll forget that they're holding one and then their audience can't hear them. So we'll vibrate the controller and, and tell you, hey, you know, bring it back up to your mouth. If you're looking at one side of the audience for too long, we will tell you to shift your attention back over to the left side. And, and there are more of these. Now, while you're speaking, we record literally everything that's happening in that virtual environment. You know, of course, your audio, but what you're doing, your actions, you know, changing your slides. Uh, if your audience members, one of them coughs, all of that is, is, is time stamped. And so you can then play it back and watch yourself in that 3D virtual environment. Go wherever you want. Watch yourself from any vantage point and, and inspect how you did. Now, you can also review analytics that were captured, you know, dozens and dozens of analytics that were captured while you were giving that speech. Your attention distribution, uh, how much you looked at the right versus the left, uh, how many filler words you said, what filler words you said, um, what percentage of all the words you said were filler words? How fast you were talking? And in this case, you can see a heat map of where your hands were, uh, you know, near, close, far, high, low. You can really inspect how you did. And we take all of these analytics and we drive a grade from them. We create a grade that you can then use to challenge yourself as you give subsequent practice speeches. Now, if you want human feedback, you can share that speech with someone else who has Ovation. They can put their headset on, launch Ovation, and they can stand in that virtual environment in which you gave that original speech, and they can watch you in there. Um, or you can render a 2D video of your speech 
You can share it with them. They can go on the Ovation web platform and they can watch it just like this person's doing here. Uh, they can look at the analytics. They can look at the grades, get a real sense of how you did, and then maybe type a comment to you and, and give you some feedback. All right, so that's, that's kind of the, the basic flow of it. So how did we, how did we integrate eye tracking with the Vive Pro Eye? In two, two main ways. Um, one, we took the head tracing that we were doing before and we improved it by sort of replacing it with eye tracing. Um, and then we also added new features that would be impossible without eye tracking. Um, so how did we improve existing features? Well, uh, head tracing is sort of approximated gaze data, right? Y your eyes could be looking somewhere entirely different from where your head is pointed. And this, this image on the left gives you a sense of that. So this is the heat map feature in, in Ovation. We know exactly where you looked throughout the duration of your speech. And then we can show a 3D heat map of that. Uh, the speaker in this case was looking at the woman at the head of the table there, but the sort of red part of the heat map is off to her left. And so you can see the divergence in accuracy here. Now, <clears throat> in a larger venue, if it's further away, these differences are magnified. Um, so with eye tracking, the, the inaccuracy is completely wiped away. And, and this heat map becomes much more useful and accurate and, and, and you can learn from it. Now on the right hand side is our gaze guiders feature. Uh, what that does is you look out at the audience and a red sphere will appear over somebody's head. And you look at that person, you make eye contact with them. That sphere then turns green, fades away, and then shows up on somebody else's head. And the idea is to have you naturally make eye contact with people, to sort of force you to do so throughout your speech. Now the problem is when we had head tracing, we had to create this, this giant uh, area of forgiveness because you would look at, at the red sphere and, and nothing would happen. Well, it's because your eyes were looking at the red sphere, not your head. And with this area of forgiveness, the, the, the real problem with it is it would activate before you really ever looked at that person or you, didn't, you weren't even trying to look at that person, but it sort of intersected it, it thought you were looking at them and it just didn't really feel all that useful. So, but with eye tracking, we don't need an area of forgiveness. In fact, we know when you're looking at their eyes. So when you look at their eyes and you make eye contact with them, then we get rid of that sphere and we put it on somebody else's head. And it suddenly feels extremely useful and impactful to you and helps you with, with, your, with your eye contact skills. All right, so what are, the, what are the new features that we added? Speech tool staring. Now in, in the left image here, you'll see the teleprompter. It's entirely red. And on the right hand side, you'll see a note card that's also red. The reason they're red is because the speaker was staring at them too long relative to looking at their audience. Now, these objects are relatively small in that virtual environment. And with head tracing, I had no idea if you were looking at them. So I couldn't use this feature at all. And this is, exemplified on the left hand side where the, the green line is the eye tracing, the red line is the head tracing. There's a 25 to 30 degree difference between those two things. Um, so so this, this feature suddenly becomes useful. And in fact, uh, I think this is one of the most important features in the entire program. Uh, and it's made possible by eye tracking. Another one is audience member reactions. So. In Ovation, we have an AI system that drives the audience and, and, and tries to make it as realistic as possible. But we realized we could take that sort of even further by, because we knew when you were looking at a particular individual and when you did, we could drive a reaction from them. So they could maybe sort of look away suddenly, uh, shift in their seat, break, break eye contact with you, uh, maybe think about what you said, there's dozens and dozens of these, you know, not in agreement, disagree, so on and so forth. And it's amazing how much more realistic and how, how alive the audience feels when you suddenly realize that they're reacting to your eye contact. Again, not possible without eye tracking. And then uh, while you're giving your speech, I mentioned we're recording you. Well, then you play it back and here's your, here's your avatar during playback. Well, we can now drive their eye movement to be exactly the same as what it was when you were giving your speech. It blinks, um, looks around, 
and often at times the eyes are looking nowhere near the, where the head's looking. Before, the eyes were just static, staring straight ahead. Suddenly this avatar comes to life and we're looking to, you know, of course, add mouth movement. He just saw the, the, the lip, lip tracking. Um, you know, we'd like to give him arms at some point uh, and a neck, but you get the idea here. Uh, and then foveated rendering. So we made the decision early on to build Ovation for PC VR. And our hypothesis, which we think is, is, is more and more true each day, is that users need a level of fidelity, a level of realism, where they're convinced that improving in a virtual world will translate to improving in, in, in real world. Uh, and so with foveated rendering, well, with the new headsets, right, there's, there's, there's bumps in resolution, which helps us with that, makes it seem even more realistic. But with those bumps in resolution, the great thing about foveated rendering is it, it sort of shoulders the burden of that additional resolution. It puts it on the driver software and less on the, on the user's GPU, which gives us a little more room to play with um, in terms of graphical fidelity. Um, so, uh, you know, there's, for us, there's no, no going back. Uh, you know, hardware manufacturers are convinced that eye tracking is important. I'm a developer. I, I, it's hard for me to sell headsets or, or recommend to customers to get headsets without eye tracking. Um, and I think consumers are going to start demanding it. So as a developer, I would highly recommend you start playing around with it, thinking, think about how it can improve uh, your program. Thank you. We're going to do a Q&A now. So if you have any questions, please, there's a microphone there. And we also have a, a special treat for you guys. We have a product reveal. This is the uh, lip accessory for the uh, Pro. And, and we'll do the Q&A, and then maybe you can gather around and take a, a closer look. Can't let you touch it, though. Um, <laughs> And then after that, of course, we have uh, uh, the VDA Awards and party. You can follow us afterwards. But please, uh, feel free to come up to the mic and ask some questions. Hi. <clears throat> Hi. Thank you for the presentation. F this is a question for the XR development. For the um, room spatial mapping, um, will those rooms and those mappings be saved the way that HoloLens saves their room mappings and holograms and uh, links that to a wireless router. So the, the question is about saving different rooms. Uh, Basically, yeah, persistent, um, persistent spatial rooms. mapping. Yes. So I, I think right now we you can you can save that and we'll remember it uh, for the next one. We, I don't think we have something for every single room, not yet, right? We, we do save it, but I guess you have to manage. There's, there's no slam, is what I'm saying. So that's not ready yet. But we, you can save each one of these. Um, if you scan again, it'll just overwrite. But I guess you can just back it up. And you can manage your own uh, saved scanned rooms. OK, great. You can manage them yourself. OK, thank you. Also, a question for the eye tracking. So there's been some talk that um, eye tracking will improve the foveated ren rendering. Um, is that an automatic thing or something that developers will have to manually handle and manage? In other words, like, uh, you know, increasing the resolution right where the user is looking with their eyes and blurring everything else, all the other pixels around it. Yeah, so we've, we've integrated foveated rendering into Ovation. Uh, and sort of and, and NVIDIA takes care of that. So the eye tracking is coming from the Vive Pro Eye. And then we hook in the, the SDK that has the VRS driver in there, um, and, and it just works. OK, great. Yeah. Thank you. So this is a question for Jeff. I have to know, did you use your own app in preparation for this talk? Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? No? Yeah. 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 Oh, you can? Uh, absolutely. Um, as a matter of fact, I was using it about a half hour ago in my hotel room, and I took it off, and I had you know the the, the situation here where it's 
Um, and I was like, man, I hope that goes away before I give my speech. <laughs> Thank you. That was cool. Yeah. Hi, for the uh, spatial mapping, how much of that is relegated to hardware on the headset versus hardware on the PC? Computer, uh, processing wise. Uh, processing wise, it does use uh, NVIDIA CUDA services. Okay. And um, for the eye tracking, is that all going to be for the first party eye tracking that is coming with the uh, next version of the Vive or can third party eye tracking devices attached to the Vive be used? Um, we're, we're looking into taking that into consideration. Yep. Much of the SR works and SR and Nepal is, is trying to look forward and be uh, agnostic on the hardware as much as possible, even though right now it does require NVIDIA CUDA services. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the talk. Um, what is the distance of the, uh, what is the maximum distance at which depth can be detected inside of the stereoscopic? Um, uh, stereoscopic cameras. Is Max it five meters or 10 depth. meters? What's the maximum distance uh, at which depth can be detected? Well, best the result is probably two, me two, me two, two meters. Two meters, okay. So if there was something four meters away, it wouldn't be able to tell what the depth of that was. Uh, I mean, uh, for two meters, that's for 3D reconstruction because you, you, you look far away, like we are uh, accuracy we are uh, yeah. lower. So we, we suggest you, when you do a spatial mapping, that will take around the two minutes, okay. two meters. Okay, thank you. Uh, hi, uh, I had a question about the, uh, the mouth tracking. Um, you mentioned something about there being 24 different poses. Is that customizable? Can you do different numbers of poses and um, Different and are there like different, I guess, emotions or expressions built in, or, or are you taking in kind of raw data to to pick the pose? So the question is about the twenty four blend shapes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, is there going to be? Uh, can, can you make more or ex emo expressions and more? With the mouth tracking, for, can you can you add more blend shapes? Mm, no. <laughs> the mass mass is 26. Can, you can, you can, if you don't, we can, you can use less for the yeah. generate more. Okay, so you can do, you could do like a more simplified, like there's four or six yeah, or, sure. okay, cool. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Just have a quick question about uh, the eye tracking and analytics in there, because it's the eye tracking is supplied by Toby, correct? In the Vive Pro Eye, yeah. Yeah, so um, what do you need to use the Toby eye tracking SDK for versus what you can get just directly through SR Works? Well, so the SDK we're accessing is uh, SR Annabelle. Um, okay. It's essentially a wrapper. Yeah. So okay, we, so you need licensing for the, you know, and to get any kind of research data out of um, the Toby eye tracking within there, so you actually, need to go through I can, there. I can answer that probably a little bit more in depth. Okay. So when we're looking at eye tracking in general, um, the SDK will be the SR Anapol SDK. Mm -hmm. So in terms of licensing, analytical use, all that stuff will be managed by HTC. So when we look at extending either additional integrations or other simplification or additional tools, you'll have one consistent SDK. So whether you're developing for the Pro I or you're even using kind of wave technologies, we want to make sure that that development pipeline is consistent. Right. Thank you. Thanks, Vinay. I had a question about um, like the real-time SR Works reconstruction because uh, I tried using the SR Works in the past, and uh, it seemed like you had to first scan your environment before you can interact with it. Uh, there wasn't really like a good real-time way of uh, interacting with your environment. Uh, but I saw in your demo earlier, it seemed like you guys have that real-time. Yes, just dynamic mesh. Uh, you don't need to scan. In fact, you saw, saw one, one video that showed that you were scanning at the same time as interacting. Mm -hmm. But there is a dynamic mesh. You don't need to do a, a static scan that you'll get, you'll get the, uh, the collider working in real time. And, and it's possible to do it. Um, so, so do you still have to do like scan the area and then save the area? Only if you're actually interacting with that area. Uh -huh. Um, you can have, if, if it's for dynamic objects, people walking your hands, uh, mm -hmm. you can do interactions without having to scan. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, uh, quick question. Will there be an ability to train these modules to recognize custom objects? Like you have a, a three-dimensional object you want it to recognize. Will you be able to train it? Training the AI for the is more uh, Say a complex structure like an Epson projector or something, you know, something very specific. This on the print for our design, like we I have mentioned that the first world architecture, actually we were planning you can just plug in what model you train in. After we design, we design our interface. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? We'll get you a free pass at the party tonight. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, everyone.